Hello. Why don't you want to talk to me? Who is this? You tell me your name, I'll tell you mine. <laughs> I don't think so. What's that noise? Popcorn. You making popcorn? Uh-huh. I only eat popcorn at the movies. Well, I'm getting ready to watch a video. Really? What? Oh, just some scary movie. You like scary movies? Uh-huh. What's your favorite scary movie? Scream almost single-handedly revitalized both the slasher genre and director Wes Craven's career. It had four direct sequels spanning over 25 years, and the series as a whole has taken in over $740 million at the box office. Most people just assume that writer Kevin Williamson used his love of movies to craft a chilling, smartly written horror film, but did you know that the idea for Scream is based on a horrific true story? Lock your doors and don't answer the phone as we find out what the f really happened to this horror movie. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Really Happened to This Horror Movie, and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to the channel, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. Scream was the combination of as-of-yet-unheard-of screenwriter Kevin Williamson and the legendary horror director Wes Craven teaming up to tell a story about a new wave of slashers. Williamson's first screenplay was Scream. Can you imagine the kind of swagger that would lend you? Well, it sounds really good. <laughs> you know, it sounds really, really good. He would go on to write I Know What You Did Last Summer, The Faculty, Scream 2 and 4, as well as creating the TV shows Tell Me a Story, Scream, Time After Time, Stalker, The Following, my wife's favorite, The Vampire Diaries, and what an entirely different set of fans know him for, Dawson's Creek. His sole directorial effort was the underrated Teaching Mrs. Tingle, which he also wrote. Craven has been covered left, right, and central on this channel, and deservedly so, as he's one of the true legends of the horror genre who was the rare director to still have it in him at the time of his death, rather than fading with his output and quality like some of his contemporaries. Craven had just come off Vampire in Brooklyn and needed a hit that was also something a little different. God damn! Different because just a year before Vampire in Brooklyn, Craven had put the final stamp on A Nightmare on Elm Street with the 1994 release of Wes Craven's New Nightmare. New Nightmare would be very meta in a way that would be expanded on even further in Scream, forever changing the way slasher films would be made going forward. Everyone knows what Scream is about, but let's take a look at how it fares with comparing it to the brutal slayings that it took inspiration from. Scream takes place in the fictional California town of Woodsboro, following the murder of high school student Casey Becker and her boyfriend while she's home alone one night. Her parents discover the body when they get home and are horrified at the grisly remains. The killings that inspired the movie happened in the city of Gainesville, Florida over the course of a few days, just as the film's events take place from a Wednesday to a Friday night. And it's true that the first victim was discovered by their parents, along with the maintenance guy and apartment manager. In the movie, Casey has to answer a bunch of questions related to movies that escalate in consequences and difficulty. The first incorrect answer leads to the death of her boyfriend, and then the last question costing her her own life. Real-life killer Danny Rowling, also known as the Gainesville Ripper, snuck into his victim's apartments with the use of a screwdriver to wedge the doors open, and went straight for the deed rather than to call ahead or rev up the soon-to-be victims. There was also no targeted set of victims, but instead Rowling chose random houses and places he could break into. The rest of the film follows the aftermath and the search for the killer. Sidney Prescott, played by Nev Campbell, is the main character who also has a bit of history. Her mother was murdered just the year prior, and the town and media are bringing all that back into light. The rest of the cast includes her friends Tatum and her boyfriend Stuart, Sydney's boyfriend Billy, their friend Randy, and Tatum's deputy brother Dewey with slightly sleazy reporter Gail Weathers rounding out the main characters. These are played, respectively, by Rose McGowan, Matthew Lillard, Skeet Ulrich, Jamie Kennedy, David Arquette, and Courtney Cox. While the town of Gainesville was certainly shaken, there was no behind-the-scenes drama or specific group of friends that were involved in all the chaos. As we will see later, and for the benefit of a narrative story, Sydney was chosen specifically where Rowling had no rhyme or reason apart from convenience. In the film, Sydney is then personally attacked by the cell phone assailant and is able to escape while also assuming her boyfriend is the killer after having a cell phone fall from his pocket. This was 1996, remember, so cell phones weren't the everyday pocket computers that they are now, but instead a luxury that very few people had. Soon after the attempted attack, school is suspended in light of the murder and attacks, and shortly after, the principal is murdered too. In reality, Rowling did all his heinous deeds in a much shorter amount of time. There was no drawn-out stalking over multiple days, and there was certainly no prior contact with the victims before the murders took place. 
While cell phones were rare in the film, they were virtually non-existent when the actual killings took place, so this too was made up entirely for the motion picture. While Florida University didn't close down completely like Woodsboro High did, there were several safety measures put into place such as students being able to drop classes later than usual if they didn't feel safe, the ability to call home from campus using a toll-free system, and even the ability to move into a more secure and populated dormitory on campus. While Sydney was able to fight off her would-be killer and have a near escape, one of Rowling's victims, in fact the only one to survive, was able to talk him out of killing her. Next up in the film, Stu and Billy decide to throw a party to celebrate school getting cancelled and have a ton of students just hang out, drink, and watch movies. After most of the partygoers leave to check out the school after learning the principal was killed, Dewey's sister is killed, followed by Randy getting shot by Billy and Dewey getting stabbed. Stu and Billy reveal themselves to be the killers before Sydney gets the upper hand and kills Stu with a TV before killing Billy with the help of Gail. Everything is nicely wrapped up with only the mess left to clean up for the city police. While this dramatization plays well in a movie setting, giving us heroes, villains, chase scenes, conflicts, and resolutions, real life is often much darker with less heroics. The Gainesville Ripper committed his heinous acts all within the span of a couple nights, and bodies began to be found only after he had done all of his damage. There was absolutely no relationship between he and his victims like there was between Sidney and Billy, nor were there any other characters there to investigate what had happened. The truth is, the entire town was in a state of fear for two months when another double murder happened. This murder had nothing to do with and no connection to the other ones. Instead of a plucky high schooler that figured it out and helped stop the murders, it took dozens of police officers and investigators as well as thousands of pieces of evidence. This also took place completely on a college campus rather than a small town high school. In fact, by the time the crimes were linked to Danny Rowling, he was already in prison for another crime. There was no heroic fight from one of the victims or a police officer that got lucky. This monster was already imprisoned for a different crime and was dutifully charged with this new set of grisly murders. While Billy and Stu paid the price for their crimes immediately, Rowling was on death row for many years before paying the ultimate price in 2006, 16 years after his brutal spree was committed. The story is different in almost all of the ways that the events took place, but how about the killer? Well, Scream has two killers, and while Stu is a simple case of being peer pressured into being an accomplice in Billy's master plan... Hello? Oh, Stu, Stu, Stu. What's your motive? Billy's got one, the police are on their way, what are you gonna tell them? Peer pressure. I'm far too sensitive. Billy had a much more personal reason to go after his fellow students, and Sydney specifically. Before her mother's death, Sydney's mom had an affair with Billy's dad, and it was the reason that his family broke up. While the character of Cotton Weary, played in the first three movies by Liev Schreiber, is set up to take the fall and actually does jail time for it, it's actually Billy and Stu that kill her. They are able to pin the murder on Cotton as he too had an affair with Sydney's mother Maureen. Cut to the events of Scream, and Billy and Stu are planning on framing Sydney's father for the murders they have committed and what they are about to do to Sydney and her dad. While Billy has a nice little anecdote about why he doesn't need a motive in this day and age, his planning that took over a year would certainly suggest otherwise. Rolling, on the other hand... Well, first and foremost, there was only one killer. All five murders, the same amount that take place in the film, were perpetrated by one sick man. While Stu had the excuse of going a little mad and being pushed by peer pressure, and Billy felt like the Prescott family had torn his own family apart, Danny Rowling, who would eventually get the moniker of the Gainesville Ripper, merely had the opportunity and the convenience of camping near where his selected victims were. Rowling was born into an abusive family before joining the Air Force and subsequently being honorably discharged just two years later. In 1989, he would brutally attack and kill the three members of the Grissom family, something he wouldn't admit to until just moments before he was put to death. A year after that, he would have a fight with his father, which would lead to attempted murder. Danny would shoot his father once in the gut and once in the face before fleeing. This would put a warrant out for him for attempted murder and send him to his future campsite before the brutal slayings. Rowling would end up just outside the college town of Gainesville, where he would murder five people over the course of three nights, with the third night already having the grisly acts of the first night as public knowledge. After a different suspect had been arrested, Rowling chose a less brutal crime by robbing a supermarket at gunpoint. He was subsequently arrested, and after the killing stopped, the police discovered his abandoned campsite, where they found audio recordings with, I'm not kidding, him singing songs about what he was going to do. Four years later, when he was about to go on trial, he admitted to the murders and was sentenced to death unanimously by a jury. The majority of the jury, by a vote of 12 to 0, advise and recommend to the court 
that it imposed the death penalty upon Danny Harold Rowley. I purposefully left out details such as the specifics of the crime and the names of the victims. Both of these items are available online in this age of obsession with true crime, but be warned, they are not pleasant. The movie has less to do with the actual facts than any of the other ones we've talked about so far, but learning about the details, it's definitely for the best. Scream is a genre-shaping must-watch experience for the horror community, but the real-life inspiration for the film is better left to history, burned alongside the thousands of pieces of evidence that Florida police took care of in 2008. Horror movies are scary, but real life can be downright terrifying. Damn little shits. What'd you call me? Huh? Not your friend. 